So um, as Daniel said, we're going to talk about outhouses today. We're going to tackle that um, really fun topic. Um, it, it really often comes with that stigma of hillbillies, especially in Arkansas. We associate that with hillbillies. Um, but we're going to look at outhouses in a more general sense to start with, and then we'll start narrowing in on um, the Arkansas outhouse specifically. And I do have notes to keep me on task in case I have a squirrel moment. So y'all bear with me. Um, and the most popular mindset, we often think of the wooden outhouse door with the crescent moon. Um, this is actually an apocryphal myth that it belonged to the women's outhouse. But the theory behind that is that the women's outhouses are going to be the ones that survive longer. You're going, to, you're going to take care of them better than you are the men's outhouse. So that's why we don't have quite as many with the stars on them. Um, at least that's the theory. Um, so most of the men's outhouses have fallen into a state of disrepair um, or disuse. Um, and then some were just repurposed over time. Um, this is the fun part, the etymologies. Um, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, the use of the word outhouse is a distinctly American moniker. It's not used anywhere else in the world. Historically, it could have been used for any unattached domestic building, um, so including your kitchen or anything else, um, or a shed or a barn. But we took it, we modified it, and we used it for our privies. The first rec uh, recorded use of it in relation to this type of structure is in 1819 by a Mr. W. Sewell. Um, privy is often the standard nomenclature. Its first recorded date is relating to, uh, relating to a latrine is circa 1225. So it does go back farther, but it's not as common. Um, other names you might have heard are back house, water closet, latrine, Johnny, comfort station, pokey, Federal Building, White House, Garderobe, Depository, or the Back 40. Um, I titled this one Out by the Woodpile um, because it's unseemly in certain historical periods for women to be noticed seeking the privy. Um, so the woodpile was often kept nearby, so if a woman stepped out of the privy and a man was nearby, she could pick up a load of wood and take it back into the house with her and act like she had been out there seeking wood and not a comfort station. Um, so it's really an important part of our life. Um, and James Whitcomb Riley actually wrote a poem about it. Um, he wrote an ode to the outhouse. Um, the passing of the back house is the name of the poem. It says, when memory keeps me company and moves me to smiles and tears, a weather-beaten object looms through the mist of years. Behind the house and barn it stood, a half a mile or more, and hurrying feet a path had made straight to its swinging door. Its architecture was a type of simple classic art, but in the tragedy of life it played a leading part. And off the passing traveler drove slow and heaved a sigh to see the modest hired girl slip out with glances shy. We had our posy garden that the women loved so well. I loved it too, but better still, I loved the stronger smell that filled the evening breezes so full of homely cheer and told the night overtaken tramp that human life was near. On lazy August afternoons, it made a little bower, delightful where my grandsire sat and whiled away an hour. For there the summer morning, its very cares entwined and berry bushes reddened in the steaming soil behind. All day, fat spiders spun their web to catch the buzzing flies that flitted to and from the house where Ma was making pies. And once a swarm of hornets, bold had built a palace there and stung my unsuspecting at, I must not tell where. Then father took a flaming pole, that, that was a happy day. He nearly burned the building up, but the hornets left to stay. When summer bloom began to fade and winter to carouse, we banked the little building with a heap of hemlock boughs. But when the crust was on the snow and sullen skies were gray, in sooth, the building was no place where one would wish to stay. We did our duties promptly there. One purpose swayed the mind. We tarried not, nor lingered long, on what we left behind. The torture of the icy seat would make a Spartan sob, for needs must scrape the goose flesh with a lacerating cob. 
that from a frost-encrusted nail hung pendant by a string. My father was a frugal man and wasted not a thing. When Grandpa had to go out back and make his morning call, we'd bundle up the dear old man with muffler and a shawl. I knew the hole on which he sat was padded all around, and once I dared to sit there, twas all too wide, I found. <laughs> My loins were all too little, and I jackknifed there to stay. They had to come and get me out, or I'd have passed away. Then Father said ambition was a thing boys should shun, and I must use the ch a children's hole till childhood's days were done. But I still marvel at the craft that cut those holes so true, the baby hole, the slender hole that fitted Sister Sue, that dear old country landmark I've tramped around a bit. And in the lap of luxury, my lot has been sit. But ere I die, I'll eat the fruit of trees I robbed of yore, then seek the shanty where my name is carved upon the door. I wean the old familiar smell with sooth my jaded soul. I'm now a man, but nonetheless, I'll try the children's hole. Um, so going farther back, um, the Greeks and the Romans also had outhouses of a sort. Um, they, used, they had indoor chambers. In Europe, you have chamber pots, jugs, and other options available, but the removal of human waste was dicey at best. Um, we have reports of it being thrown from windows, so pedestrians beware. Um, and it often filled the streets and waterways of most of the populous areas. Um, during the medieval period, Europeans with sufficient wealth um, would have indoor chambers um, called garter robes. And it was believed at the time that the ammonia, garter robes, yeah, it's G-A-R-D-E-R-O-B-E-S, garter robes. Um, and so they would think that the ammonia was good for killing the fleas and lice on the clothes. And so whenever a guest would visit, they would hang them in their cloaks in the privies. Yes. <laughs> um, so, um, most societies used these ch um, chambers, they tried to build them over flowing water, but eventually this kind of causes problems with your water system, and at one point in Europe, Europe's history, you couldn't actually fish the rivers without having to worry about diseased fishes. Um, so, the first proper indoor toilet built in England um, was supposedly Sir John Harrington's Ajax water closet which he built for his godmother, Queen Elizabeth I. Um, it actually became a joke um, amongst the, the nobility um, and was the only one built until 200 years later. In 1848, English, England passes the Public Health Act, which set the standard for world plumbing codes to come. Um, and during Queen uh, Victoria's reign, the population actually began to see the relationship between um, proper privies and public health. Um, but Prince Albert's still gonna die of typhoid. They don't notice it soon enough. Um, we also find privies in colonial America. Thomas Jefferson had really elaborate outhouses, as did some of the other upper-class um, citizens. In Arkansas, we actually, actually have mixed um, records. Someone told me, probably about the time I was doing this originally, um, that they did not have outhouses when he was growing up. Um, this man was probably in his 60s. Um, he said that even, even, as, even at that point, women didn't uh, seek an outhouse. They would just go find some place in the woods where they could find privacy. But in northwest Arkansas, where this guy is from, our populations are a lot, a lot smaller at this point, and so you did have a little more privacy. And also, this, this kind of structure might be something that was considered a luxury or an unnecessary expense. Um, one account that I read about Arkansas um, privies was basically it was two holes, or two poles, sorry, straddling a hole in the ground. And you would just go and straddle the poles. Um, eventually, um, a rough structure was built around these little poles over the holes <laughs> in the ground. Um, but um, but it, 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 it takes a while. It takes a while for it to kick off. Oops. So outhouses came in many shapes and sizes. Um, they could be architecturally elaborate as you could afford. This one dates from about 1850. This one's in Delaware. 
Um, so 1857 is what it says, but it's in, it's in Delaware. Um, they could be multi-storied. Think about that. Um, they could be also attached or detached from the main structures. If you want to know how this is actually constructed, um, they're slanted at the back. Well, actually, it'll run this way. And then it'll, they'll have a little chamber that runs down through here. And so hopefully the person in the lower story, um, hopefully, um, they're protected. Um, in cooler climates, some were wrapped in furs, tarps, and other materials to prevent bitter winds sneaking through the cracks. Um, they could also um, be constructed with brick, but were often wooden because you would want to be able to move them from place to place. You really didn't want them to stay in one place. Um, but this one's in Pennsylvania, and it is a brick structure. Sorry. Um, this one is an Arkansas outhouse. Um, you will notice it here alongside the road. So basically a way station or a, a rest stop. Um, this one is in Springdale. We also can't talk about the Arkansas outhouse without mentioning the Arkansas hillbilly. I would like to take a second though. This is Siloam Springs. Anybody familiar with Siloam? A little bit, okay. This is the downtown park now. Um, and they have a long drop outhouse, which means it's over wa running water um, and it's off to the side here in the background. Um, so how many times have you seen a cartoon or a business in Arkansas specifically with the requisite hillbilly? Like it happens. It, it's a little less now than what it used to be, but it's still pretty common. Um, he's shoeless. He has on overalls that are usually ripped or torn and his feet are huge and bony ankles are visible. Um, sometimes he has a long beard and a tall battered hat. Um, the women were just as likely to smoke a pipe whenever she was portrayed. And we're all familiar with this image. We also are familiar with the outhouse imagery that often accompanies the stereotype. Some will capitalize it. Um, in Mountain View, Arkansas, they hold an outhouse race as part of their bean fest every year. Um, others will try to get away from it because they see the outhouse as part of that um, poverty-stricken past. But you're actually going to see that it's a move towards progress if I do my job right today. It's actually an innovation and it's a good thing and we should be proud of our outhouses. Um, so this one is an abandoned one. Um, I like pretty pictures. It's part of my job. So um, I'm going to throw as many pictures at you as I can. Um, and this is in Madison County. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, you're going to find amp uh, rampant outbreaks of diseases. Scientists are only just beginning at this point to understand how diseases and germs are transmitted, and bathing is not just a luxury. It's actually, in most cases, discouraged by medical professions. They're afraid you're going to catch an illness or a disease from bathing and getting too cold, um, or just getting something from the water. Um, so according to archaeology, in the 1860s, virtually no one in Arkansas has an outhouse, at least in rural areas. Um, and even by the 1920s, they're still considered unnecessary structures or a luxury in Arkansas. So cholera is one of the major infections we see as a result of failed sanitation. It's caused by the consumption of food or water that's contaminated with the bacteria. This is usually a result of an infected person's waste coming into contact with the food or polluting the water supply. Because symptoms can be mild, most people will go through without realizing that they have the disease until it's too late. Symptoms include diarrhea and vomiting, which can quickly lead to dehydration and eventually to death. Today we clean our food well, wash our hands after visits to the toilet, and our water often goes through several filtration systems before it gets to us. Um, we also have access to a vaccine for this. Um, not all of these diseases have a vaccine. Um, it does have a short-term lifespan, the vaccine, 
Um, so its effectiveness is very limited. Um, infected inv individuals can be treated with antibiotics to shorten the duration of the symptoms and prevent the dis uh, spread of the disease. So what did we do before that? Um, in 1880, Little Rock reported a major outbreak of cholera. Um, it was believed that a previous outbreak in both Memphis and New Orleans was the uh, origin, and it spread via the railroad and the ships coming up the river. Um, the first case reported um, resulted in death on July 5th, um, and the next case also ended in death in, um, on July 6th. The health department actually has a report on this, and it makes note that the first victim lived very affluently, but the sec second victim was part of the poorer part of Little Rock. Um, so it didn't matter where you lived, um, you, you were just as susceptible to these kinds of diseases. Um, Little Rock actually would shut down the ports, and you would have to stay on the ship for days and days and days and days until they decided that the quarantine could be lifted. Um, so Little Rock will actually go on to alter their sewage system, and those sewage systems are available online. They're really cool to look at, but so are these reports. Um, and the quarantine from time to time of passengers aboard the trains or the ships um, are suspected of being ill helped. Um, in one instance, a boat had to be moved up and down the river for two months before they were allowed to dock because they had to make sure that nobody was sick. Typhoid is the second disease. Um, we've all heard the expression typhoid Mary. We all know who she is, I think, but I'm gonna give you a little information in case. She was actually a cook who can, um, contracted typhoid, but she remained asymptomatic all the way to the end of her life. Um, she was eventually taken in by authorities to a hospital for quarantine in 1907. She peti petitioned the courts for release and was initially denied that request. Later, she was released so long as she promised to find another profession and not as a cook. Um, but in 1915, she was apprehended again because of an outbreak at Sloan Maternity Hospital in Manhattan, where she was the cook. She remained under quarantine for the rest of her life. Um, in all, it is estimated that she infected over 40 people, three of whom died. Typhoid is caused by exposure to the salmonella, um, typhi, or typhi bacteria, like cholera, food and water are contaminated by a carrier's waste. Typhoid fever results when some of the major organs are infected, as well as the bone marrow. Um, it's also treated with antibiotics. Preventative measures we take are very similar to those found um, in cholera pre uh, prevention. Here comes the fun one. This one's my favorite part, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> So the third major infection as a result of poor sanitation is hookworm. Um, hookworm larvae live in the soil in warmer climates, so it is strictly a southern thing. Um, humans become infected when walking barefoot through an infected area. The worm then enters through the soles of the feet, moves to the bloodstream, this is a terrible topic for lunch, um, <laughs> migrating to the lungs, and then into the intestine and are eventually expelled through recontam and thus recontaminating the soil. Symptoms include lethargy, or lethargy, <laughs> bloated bellies, anemia, and stunted growth. So think about your hillbilly. Um, treatment included Epsom salts and thymol. Um, preventative measures were slow in taking off and these included shoes and outhouses. Um, and they would have gone a long way in preventing or, yeah, preventing the spread of infection, at least in rural Arkansas, many of the population were too poor for both shoes and the outhouse. Dr. Benjamin Washburn reported that those afflicted with hookworm are pale and anemic, and in children, development, both physical and mental, is retarded, and an infected child is dull and backward at school. Adults may feel weak, tire easily, and have shortness of breath. In short, this is what we call the lazy man's disease. It, er, um, it tied the affliction of filth um, to the south and made the southerner seem even more um, lazy and backward and unclean than he actually was. So we also begin to see that the slow mental um, and physical hillbilly is, like, is likely the result of an infection, hookworm. So it's important. 
Um, we can't discuss prevention and treatment without also examining some of the folk remedies or kitchen magic, as the early anthropologists called it. Cholera was believed by folk doctors and granny women and other laypersons to be caused by eating fresh fruit, um, since it often appeared during the summer months <laughs> when these items were more readily available. They called it a summer complaint, and they often treated it with clove tea, cholera, uh, morbus weed tea, and blackberry root tea. Um, the reason it's more likely to occur during the summer is um, because of what is called night farming. Um, so some people who didn't have outhouses would actually go into their pastures or into their gardens and they would help fertilize. Um, according to the Cherokee physician, the cholera morbus root or weed is an herb mostly found in bottoms and on the banks of the streams in shady places. It has a whitish fibrous root, rather small, smooth, growing from six inches to a foot high. It leaves, its leaves are smooth, roundish, with an indentation on each side of a bright green color. The root is the part that's used. Um, it's a tonic, an antiseptic, an antiemetic, and is certainly a remedy for cholera. When the fever or typhoid struck, a doctor had to be called. The granny women couldn't help. Worms were treated with peppermint, tansy root, or pink root tea, and then purging. Whether or not these were specific to hookworm or generically refers to worms is left up to the researcher. So the Rockefeller Foundation um, has a great early impact on hookworm eradication. While hookworm was their goal, they set the public stage for public health education. Um, at the turn of the century, ap approximately 40% of the southern population was infected with hookworm. The Rockefeller Fa Sanitary Commission collected data, treated hookworm, and began the steps to establish health education in nine states, including Virginia, North Carolina, Georgia, South Carolina, Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Alabama. By 1913, they had extended their efforts to Kentucky and Texas as well. In these states, they found half the population had privies and only 10% had proper privies, whatever that means. Um, schools and rural populations were still going over the hill. The Rockefeller Sanitary Commission sets up shop in 1909 and in, by 1910 has earnestly begun its crusade against hookworm in the southern states. Besides the numbers shown here, they also delivered 507 lectures on putting a stop to soil pollution to 50,139 people in Arkansas alone. 10 counties were surveyed for privy conditions and about 10,000 homes were inspected. They would interview the children, their parents, they would conduct medical interviews, they would also do medical examinations and um, it, the reports are fascinating, but a little gross. Um, it was estimated that 39% of the school children in the South were still infected with hookworm when the commission leaves in 1914. But a health commission had been established in Arkansas as a result of this campaign. Growing public awareness is leading to a demand for vaccines for other diseases and infections. Cholera, typhoid, and hookworm will continue to rampage throughout the population into the 1920s. But the steps have been made in the right direction. Outhouses and privy pits were dug, and when possible, steps had been taken to ensure that there's not a reinfection because of contaminated water, soil, or food. As for hookworm, schools will begin to require screenings prior to admitting a student. So this is some of our early vaccination laws was we're checking for hookworm. Um, the Rockefeller Commission will be followed by some state measures, but things don't really take off for a while. Um, it's not until the 1920s that vaccinations, nurses um, in rural communities and other medical practice um, will actually greatly impact cholera and typhoid outbreaks. Then the bottom falls out. We're starting to make these great strides towards um, public awareness and public education and medical advancements. And then in the 1920s, Arkansas suffers a series of droughts and floods, and we've got bigger issues that we've got to worry about. 
So the state itself is actually on the brink of bankruptcy in 1927 and has overextended what support it can provide its population. We've all seen the depression images, um, the poverty-stricken and destitute families. Despite the stereotype of the lazy hillbilly, these families are hardworking individuals whose way of life was just destroyed, most cases, by a flood or a drought or some sort of blight. But they're still going to be taking pictures of the bare feet. This is actually part of the WPA project. When the stock market crashes in 1929 and the Dust Bowl wipes out farmland on the plains, the rest of the country finds itself hit very hard. In some ways, Arkansas will feel the depression less than the rest of the country because they led simpler lives, relied less on the industries and economic institutions hit the hardest, and because they had already experienced the loss for several years prior to 1929. Um, through federal programming and loan programs, Arkansas is going to thrive and dig its way out of the pit it had found itself in. Agriculture in the state is going to feed and clothe populations in the eastern states and overseas. And through public work projects, Arkansas is going to move into the 20th century. The New Deal allows the state to expand the college at Fayetteville, build better schools, legion huts, and infrastructure that some states already took for granted with farm-to-market roads. They're also going to improve sanitation. Many towns will get their first sewage treatment plant as part of the New Deal. Farmers and rural communities will receive low interest loans to add sanitation units and privies. Schools in particular are going to be greatly impacted by these efforts. Not only were privies made available through loans and financing options, but the government begins um, to mass produce um, outhouses and improve on the structure. The concrete bases that are here um, were made in Missouri and brought to Arkansas and Texas. They're shipped up. The concrete prevented snakes from crawling in. Um, it prevented wasps from building nests. And it also prevented seepage into the soil. So it slowed that process. Ventilation was improved. You didn't think you were going to die every time you walked in during the summer. Education programs also accompanied the structure. Um, farm bulletins, um, and you can find those online, went out with suggested improvements as well as, as pamphlets from the Department of the Interior with improved detailed building plans. So if you couldn't afford one of these, you could at least build your own with materials you had on hand. Um, and they, they understood the importance of this, so they were trying to get that information out, however they could get it out there. Um, so these numbers um, are pretty incredible if you think about it. 2,309,239 newly constructed privies were built in the U.S. as part of the New Deal program. 39,898 privies were reconstructed or improved upon in the U.S. In Arkansas, there were 27 utility plants were built or improved upon, 62 miles of water mains were laid, 96 miles of storm drains and sanitary sewers were laid, and 53,808 privies were built. Most of the outhouses you see in Arkansas are going to be these wood-sided concrete pit types that you get out of the New Deal. Um, on occasion, you're going to see something more like what I have on the next slide. This one was actually, I went hunting for outhouses once upon a time. Um, and this was constructed as part of the uh, CCC work at what is the lake? Lake Weddington, outside Asylum Springs or Fayetteville, depending on which side of the highway you're on. Um, this one is found at Norwood School um, and is, was in use until the 1980s. I have used this outhouse. Um, uh, originally, the girls' toilet for the school, it was later used when the building became a church and then a community building. Um, it has two holes, so it's a two-holer. Um, and the current owner has covered it over. Um, the boys' toilet still exists as well. 
um, and he's using it right now as his well house. So, <laughs> which think about that and the seepage. Um, so there's also the question of whether these are sanitary or not. Outhouses were still in use in the 1940s and 1950s and later. Um, some of the people um, that I've spoken with and some of the articles I've read actually um, reported that it was considered unsanitary to have your toilet in the same house that you, or the same building that you cooked in. So they kept using the outhouses because they actually saw them as more sanitary than indoor plumbing. Um, <laughs> so they continued to utilize them rather than the modern conveniences. And so here's the modern conveniences, in case we didn't know. Um, the programs that made outhouses readily available also provided for their demise. Um, indoor plumbing and sewage systems became more affordable and available. The population in general moves quickly to make the upgrade to indoor toilets and no more trips to the, in the snow f to the outhouse. I mean, I don't really fancy that either. Um, chemical toilets are also used about this time. Today, we're seeing the rise of composting toilets. Um, and so these are sometimes in the house, sometimes not. Um, Christopher Ingram reported in 2014 through the Washington Post that 1.6 million Americans still do not have indoor plumbing for whatever reason. Sometimes it's a personal choice. Um, but it, um, I dug a little deeper and found that in 2013, the Census, U.S. Census Bureau actually conducted um, a tally and asked whether or not homes had an indoor plumbing. Um, a half of a percent of the national population reported back a lack of indoor plumbing. Alaska had some of the highest percentages, which we know um, anybody who watches HGTV, um, you see that that's always an issue. Um, in Arkansas, Newton County reported the highest deficit at over 5% of the population not having indoor plumbing. Um, that means that they didn't have flushable toilets. Um, is basically what it came down to. It wasn't just indoor plumbing. The outhouse is often still associated with the hillbilly stereotype, filthiness, and mentally challenged hill folk. Um, most of them have fallen into a state of disrepair or have been repurposed into sheds and decorations in our yards. At best, it's considered quaint and at worst, a joke. But the outhouse was a step toward progress. Because the outhouse and the education programs that accompanied them, Arkansas was able to move, move past outbreaks of cholera, typhoid, and hookworm. In short, lives were saved because of proper privies. 